notre, euh, notre exploration euh, avec euh, eh bien, une, euh, une session qui s'intitule euh, Formes abrégées en scène. Et euh, voilà, nous avons le grand plaisir euh, d'avoir voilà, Lynn Potény, professeur. Euh, alors, je ne me souviens plus. Ah, je ne me souviens plus. 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 Je ne me et je vais donc euh, poursuivre euh, la pratique euh, qui a été celle de ces jours derniers. Donc, euh, je vais présenter les, les intervenants l'un après l'autre, mais et nous prendrons les questions à la fin de la, de la session, si ça, si ça convient à tout le monde. Donc, dans un premier temps, nous allons entendre Méline Dubault, qui est doctorante à l'Université Clément-Auvergne depuis septembre 2022, sous la direction de Sophie Carry et qui travaille sur la place des publics du 21e siècle dans le théâtre de Shakespeare. Euh, elle a obtenu le, le prix du mémoire de la société française Shakespeare pour son N2 l'année dernière, sur les mises en scène numériques du théâtre de Shakespeare pendant la pandémie. Et euh, elle est née fils de euh, l'auteur de trois articles dans le dernier et paru tout récemment dans la revue CHG. Donc je suis très heureuse de lui donner la parole. Et elle va euh, nous parler aujourd'hui de Shakespeare en abrégé, Hamlet en 30 minutes. Merci. merci beaucoup pour cette présentation et merci aux organisateurs et organisatrices de me permettre de communiquer aujourd'hui. Um, just a word to English speakers, I have to apologize, the presentation will be in French because I'm talking about French companies and French audiences, um, so I'm very sorry um, about this. En 1987, la Radio Shakespeare Company présente pour la première fois son spectacle The Complete Works of William Shakespeare Abridged durant lequel la compagnie abrège les 37 pièces de Shakespeare en 97 minutes. Le travail de la troupe anglophone a rencontré un franc succès avec le record de la comédie la plus longtemps jouée dans le West End à Londres. Ces formes de mini-Shakespeare sont également présentes dans le travail des compagnies françaises. En 2023, la compagnie 21 joue au Château d'Ardenau son spectacle « Dit Horatio », une version comptée de Hamlet en 55 minutes, conçue pour le jeune public à partir de 7 ans. Et la compagnie Bruticourt propose quant à elle son Hamlet en 30 minutes, une version burlesque de la pièce qui, contrairement à ce que son titre indique, dure 1h10. Ces versions minimales ne cherchent pas à entrer dans les détails. Elles résument la pièce pour la rendre plus accessible afin de transmettre au public les grandes lignes de l'œuvre. À l'inverse de mise en scène explorant l'ampleur du texte shakespearien, on pense... Ah, ok, c'est so deux dans les deux compagnies que je parle. Donc, à l'inverse de mise en scène explorant l'ampleur du texte shakespearien, on pense euh, par exemple à l'adaptation en 18 heures de la trilogie Henri VI par Thomas Joly en 2014 au Festival d'Avignon. Ces versions abrégées se concentrent davantage sur l'histoire et le contenu de la pièce que sur sa forme. Le texte de Shakespeare est présent sous la forme de quelques citations dans « Dix Horatio » et sous la forme d'extraits dans « Hamlet en 30 minutes ». Abrégé Shakespeare, c'est d'emblée jouer avec la canonicité du texte, un texte que beaucoup de spectatrices et spectateurs souhaitent entendre et voir représenté, représenté sur scène de façon fidèle. Nos deux adaptations se jouent au contraire de la sacralité du texte shakespearien et s'amusent à le modifier, jusqu'à parfois complètement le supprimer. 
Pourquoi choisir Hamlet afin d'adapter Shakespeare de façon courte L'intrigue de la pièce est-elle facilement racontable sous une autre forme Quels sont les points communs de ces deux adaptations au format réduit Quel est le public visé par ces spectacles Nous explorerons ces deux adaptations françaises non seulement par l'étude de la mise en scène, mais aussi à travers les propos de spectateurs. En effet, dans les deux cas, une étude de terrain a été réalisée permettant de recueillir les réactions du public après ces deux spectacles lors d'entretiens téléphoniques. Pour dit Horatio, cette étude a eu lieu lors du festival Shakespeare Nights au château d'Art de l'eau, un lieu disposant d'un théâtre élisabétain et proposant depuis quelques années un festival centré sur Shakespeare. Pour Hamlet en 30 minutes, j'ai pu interroger les publics du festival Théâtre sur un plateau, un festival rural offrant une programmation théâtrale variée dans le département de l'Ain. Notre objectif est d'explorer ce que proposent ces deux adaptations en se demandant quelle image de Shakespeare elles transmettent aux spectateurs. Ces formats courts, en simplifiant la pièce, cherchent-ils simplement à divertir ou permettent-ils une appropriation pour des publics habituellement peu intéressés par le texte shakespearien dans un premier temps, nous montrerons que ce passage au format court implique une transformation de la nature de la pièce elle-même qui passe de la mimesis à la diégèse et du tragique au comique. Puis, nous nous intéresserons au travail de simplification du texte en nous demandant si Shakespeare est toujours au cœur de ce travail ou si son œuvre devient en fin de compte périphérique. Enfin, nous réfléchirons au public visé par ces adaptations et à la capacité de ces dernières à convaincre les spectateurs, souvent novices, que Shakespeare leur est également destiné. Nos deux mises en scène opèrent plusieurs changements dans la nature même de la pièce de Shakespeare. Premièrement, il n'est plus possible de parler de tragédie. Dans Hamlet en 30 minutes, le ton est résolument burlesque. L'adaptation est jouée par une actrice et trois acteurs, L'un d'eux incarne un bouffon, on apprendra à la fin de la pièce qu'il s'agit d'Horatio, qui raconte l'histoire d'Hamlet et nous fait rire par ses mimiques et ses cloneries. Les trois autres artistes interprètent Hamlet à tour de rôle, jouant des moments choisis du texte shakespearien dans la traduction de François-Victor Hugo, Libre de droit. La pièce se termine sur le combat de Laërte et Hamlet, où le bouffon interprète cette fois-ci tous les rôles à grand renfort de mime. L'amas de cadavres qui clôture, la, qui clôture la pièce devient ainsi résolument comique. Horatio n'arrive sur les lieux qu'après avoir dévalé une montagne, d'où il observait le duel avec ses jumelles, n'ayant pas obtenu de place VIP pour le combat. Les différentes morts sont mimées en accentuant le grotesque des corps qui perdent leurs yeux et leurs boyaux, et la durée de la pièce elle-même est traitée avec humour. Le dispositif scénique est très simple, un cadre de bois rectangulaire sert de porte avec deux rideaux rouges qui en masquent l'entrée et au-dessus une pendule. À différents moments pendant le spectacle, le bouffon tourne l'aiguille en sens inverse pour gagner du temps sur les 30 minutes annoncées. La tragédie est transformée en comédie, les 30 minutes en une heure et le texte canonique de Shakespeare devient un matériau pour faire rire le spectateur. Comme me l'explique un membre du public, le but, c'était quand même de dédramatiser une pièce un peu dramatique au départ et de donner un autre visage à la pièce de Shakespeare. Ce visage comique est également présent dans le spectacle dit Horatio. Dans cette pièce, deux personnages sont sur scène, Horatio et Marcellus, et tous deux racontent l'histoire de Hamlet. Cinq chaises, avec sur chacune un vêtement de couleur, permettent aux acteurs de changer de personnage, chaque vêtement représentant un personnage différent. La pièce comporte également de nombreux moments comiques, notamment lors du Dumb Show, acte 3, scène 2, mimé entièrement par l'un des acteurs de façon humoristique. La pièce s'achète toutefois sur la tristesse d'Horatio et se concentre davantage sur l'amitié entre Horatio et Hamlet, tandis que le Hamlet en 30 minutes est comique d'un bout à l'autre. Quoi qu'il en soit, ces deux adaptations célèbrent joyeusement une forme d'irrévérence vis-à-vis du texte shakespearien et le changement de genre du tragique au burlesque fait partie de cette dynamique. Un autre changement essentiel a lieu en ce qui concerne la nature des pièces. Une fonction de narrateur est ajoutée dans les deux spectacles. Dans Dit Horatio, le titre lui-même indique, euh, indique que Horatio aura la charge de la fonction narrative. Dans Hamlet en 30 minutes, c'est à nouveau Horatio, le bouffon de la pièce, qui nous raconte l'histoire de Hamlet en s'aidant d'un énorme manuscrit dans lequel l'histoire serait consignée. 
La quête de Shakespeare se prête fort bien à cette transformation, puisque dans le texte original, Hamlet demande à Horatio de raconter son histoire. « And in this harsh world, throw thy breath in pain to tell my story. » De 5, scène 2. Ce souhait permet ainsi l'introduction inhabituelle d'un narrateur. Sylvain Guichard, co-créateur de dit Horatio, m'indique d'ailleurs « Techniquement, pour moi, c'est un conte avec certaines scènes qui sont jouées. » Ce passage de la mimésis à la diégèse permet ainsi d'ouvrir la représentation à un jeune public. La narration donne la possibilité de condenser et d'abréger et de dire en quelques mots ce qui ferait l'objet de plusieurs répliques, voire plusieurs scènes. Cette réduction du texte est très proche de la « Reduced Shakespeare Company ». Pourtant, les deux adaptations étudiées me semblent légèrement différentes. En effet, si la « Reduced Shakespeare Company » propose un travail de réduction du texte, ne mentionnant parfois que le titre de certaines pièces, son effet comique repose également sur une certaine connaissance de Shakespeare. Pour un public anglophone, Shakespeare est un auteur étudié à plusieurs reprises dans un cadre scolaire, ce qui n'est pas fréquemment le cas pour un public français. Peter Holland souligne « Abbreviated Shakespeare makes widely varying assumptions about what its audiences know of about Shakespeare and what they assume Shakespeare to be » turning lengthy verse drama into highlights and famous quotations, narrowed narratives and sentimentalized action, often recreating a memory of the agonies of the schoolroom. Ce rapport à l'école, qui rassemble les publics anglophones autour d'une expérience commune, n'est pas présent dans le travail des compagnies francophones. La compagnie 21, avec dit Horatio, cherche à raconter l'histoire de Hamlet pour un jeune public qui la découvre pour la première fois, et d'ailleurs souvent lors de représentations scolaires. Pour Hamlet en 30 minutes, beaucoup de membres du public ont indiqué ne jamais avoir vu ou lu la pièce de Shakespeare auparavant. Le spectacle de la Radio Shakespeare Company est accessible sans connaître les pièces de Shakespeare, mais beaucoup des moments comiques reposent sur des références précises au texte. Le but du spectacle n'est donc pas de faire connaître l'œuvre de Shakespeare au public. A l'inverse, nos deux adaptations françaises ont une visée pédagogique en plus de leur visée humoristique. Mais que reste-t-il réellement de Hamlet dans le travail de la Compagnie 21 et de la Compagnie Bruticourt La majeure partie des adaptations de Shakespeare sur la scène contemporaine sont des versions abrégées du texte avec des coupes qui permettent d'écourter plus ou moins la pièce. Toutefois, dans nos deux adaptations, il s'agit plutôt d'identifier un certain nombre de moments clés dans la pièce à résumer ou jouer pour le public. Ces deux adaptations cherchent à simplifier la compréhension de ces passages par la mise en scène. Pour une spectatrice de Hamlet en 30 minutes, le spectacle a permis de découvrir la pièce tout en s'amusant. Ça permettait d'avoir vraiment une idée de ce qu'était la pièce d'Hamlet sans avoir les trois heures, et puis de façon ludique, c'était vraiment très drôle. En effet, dans les deux cas, l'adaptation, en sélectionnant et simplifiant, propose une version moins longue, plus abordable de l'histoire, tout en résumant les points clés et en éliminant les détails de l'intrigue. Connaître les grandes lignes de Hamlet est perçu comme un atout grâce à des spectacles qui permettent de s'instruire en s'amusant, revendiquant les principes aristotéliciens du plaqueré et du dokeré. Mais qu'en est-il du mot wéré Là se trouve peut-être l'écueil de ces versions accélérées qui nous font rire plus qu'elles ne nous émeuvent. Peut-on alors toujours parler du Hamlet de Shakespeare Une spectatrice du Hamlet en 30 minutes m'explique « C'est plus le Hamlet de Shakespeare, c'est un spectacle sur Hamlet, mais pas Hamlet. » En effet, nos deux adaptations conservent la fable de Hamlet, mais ce qui fait l'intérêt de la pièce n'est-ce pas davantage sa langue et sa poésie une spectatrice de Hamlet en 30 minutes explique « J'ai trouvé qu'ils arri qu arrivaient à s'éloigner du texte tout en gardant l'esprit pour arriver à le moderniser, euh, à lui donner un côté raccord avec le monde contemporain. » Cette question de l'esprit de Shakespeare est revenue plusieurs fois. L'autodérision, la bouffonnerie et l'humour étant pour plusieurs spectateurs pleinement shakespeariens. Pour d'autres, la narration dans Hamlet en 30 minutes permettait de véritablement mettre en valeur le texte de Shakespeare. Une spectatrice m'indique « Vous êtes attentif quand il se met à parler, ça met en valeur le texte de l'auteur, parce que quand il se met à parler, tout de suite, votre esprit, enfin moi, c'est mon corps, mon esprit, se mettait en route en disant « Attention, écoute, c'est le vrai texte ». 
Le narrateur sert ainsi de guide pour mettre en valeur différents passages célèbres de la pièce que les spectateurs découvrent souvent pour la première fois. Une spectatrice indique « Ils ont réussi à vulgariser du Shakespeare et du coup à faire passer l'âme de la pièce, et ça j'ai apprécié. Mon père, qui est plus puriste que moi, je pense, a été un peu perturbé, il aurait aimé que ce soit plus classique. » Cette question des puristes est revenue à plusieurs reprises en entretien. Une division implicite sous-tend en effet nos adaptations, celle entre un théâtre élitiste et un théâtre populaire, ou « highbrow, lowbrow » pour reprendre la terminologie de Lawrence Levin. De même que la « reduced Shakespeare Company » se pose en double de la « royal Shakespeare Company », nos adaptations proposent leur version parallèle de Shakespeare, opposée à une vision plus classique et moins accessible. Cette distinction est exprimée clairement dans les propos de ces spectateurs de Hamlet en 30 minutes. Par exemple, il n'y a que quelques érudits qui peuvent garder le truc original, le texte dans son originalité pure. Je pense qu'à part ces 2% d'érudits, 98% des spectateurs sont contents d'avoir un truc qu'ils puissent comprendre correctement. Une autre spectatrice m'indique, par Hamlet au départ, c'est quand même du théâtre pour l'élite, et là, avec son histoire, ce qu'il fait, l'imbécile, je trouve que c'était pour tout le monde, et ça, je trouve ça bien. Pour une autre spectatrice, l'équilibre entre texte original et narration permettrait de satisfaire tout le monde. Ça m'a enthousiasmé. j'ai trouvé que c'était d'abord très intelligemment fait, entre le bouffon qui raconte l'histoire pour ceux qui ne la connaissent pas, et les Hamlet qui récitent du vrai Shakespeare. On retrouve ici la distinction entre le vrai et le faux, entre ceux qui connaissent et ceux qui ignorent. Le Hamlet, en 30 minutes, se moque allègrement d'une vision trop élitiste du texte shakespearien. Quand le bouffon annonce le meurtre de Priam, joué par les comédiens invités par Hamlet, il fait une pause pour regarder le public comme s'il attendait une réaction, avant de conclure « Oui, moi non plus, je ne sais pas ce que c'est ». Le narrateur se positionne ainsi du même côté que son public, le côté de ceux qui ne savent pas, qui ne connaissent pas, en opposition aux sachants. Dans « Di Horatio », lors du « Dumb Show », l'acteur incarnant Claudius descend dans le public, tout en s'installant, il soupire « Ah, le théâtre, la culture », se moquant gentiment d'un public qui se féliciterait d'aller au théâtre. Si nos deux adaptations ne transmettent pas forcément la poésie du texte shakespearien, elles permettent en revanche aux spectateurs de s'approprier une œuvre qu'ils jugent trop élitiste pour eux et d'adoucir peut-être la frontière entre divertissement populaire et théâtre de l'élite. Dans le public du Hamlet en 30 minutes, beaucoup étaient réticents à l'idée de voir une pièce de Shakespeare. Pour un spectateur, ces pièces seraient trop ennuyeuses pour être jouées dans le texte. Si on, le voit, si on les voit uniquement avec le texte d'origine, ça risque d'être un peu soporifique. Il faut être passionné comme vous par Shakespeare. Mais autrement, je pense qu'il y a un intérêt à donner un discours de notre époque, ne serait-ce que pour se sentir un peu plus concerné par les sujets. La notion de peur est également intervenue à plusieurs reprises. Une spectatrice m'indique... En fait, ça fait peur à certaines personnes, vous voyez J'ai vu des amis ce matin, je leur ai dit « Mais comment ça se fait que vous n'êtes pas venu à théâtre sur un plateau ?» Elles m'ont dit « Oh, j'ai vu Shakespeare, machin, ça ne m'a pas inspiré. » Alors, ça fait peur. Shakespeare est décrit comme difficile d'accès, compliqué à comprendre. Ce spectateur explique « Quand on voit une programmation qui met cet auteur en évidence, ce n'est pas forcément très, très attractif, ça va être compliqué, ça va être dur, ça ne va pas être intéressant. » Le titre de ces deux spectacles permet de ne pas décourager les spectatrices et les spectateurs. Je me suis perdue. Sorry. Euh, à la simple lecture de celui-ci. Avec Di Horatio, le public peut s'intéresser au spectacle sans savoir d'emblée qu'il s'agit d'une adaptation de Hamlet ou d'une adaptation de Shakespeare. Quant à Hamlet en 30 minutes, le titre annonce immédiatement une version abrégée et irrévérencieuse du texte. La présence d'un décor très simple quand le public entre en salle et le choix du titre donne ainsi des signaux clairs aux spectatrices et spectateurs afin que ceux-ci n'aient pas peur de ne rien comprendre ou de s'ennuyer. Avec Hamlet en 30 minutes, j'ai pu constater qu'un public très réticent avait été conquis et rassuré. Mais cette expérience pousse-t-elle pour autant les spectateurs à avoir davantage confiance en eux et à s'approprier le texte shakespearien pour certains, Hamlet en 30 minutes a suscité une envie de mieux connaître l'œuvre de Shakespeare, comme euh, me l'indiquent ses spectatrices. 
À la rigueur, j'aurais presque envie maintenant de le voir de façon plus classique ou de le lire carrément. Ça me donne envie de le lire à Hamlet, et puis si ça va, je me dis pourquoi pas les autres, les autres pièces. Plusieurs personnes ont aussi évoqué la réplique « être ou ne pas être », expliquant qu'il s'agissait pour eux d'une phrase répétée sans en connaître véritablement la signification. La pièce a ainsi permis de recontextualiser cette réplique célèbre. Un autre spectateur parle de la pièce comme d'un « pour » qui permettrait de mieux maîtriser l'histoire qu'en lisant le texte. L'idée de récapituler l'histoire en grandes étapes a pu donner confiance à d'autres membres du public. Ça me paraît accessible maintenant, la marche est moins haute pour rentrer dans son univers, je pense. Le découpage de l'intrigue la désacralise et la rend aussi moins impressionnante, plus facilement accessible et crée ainsi une ouverture vers d'autres œuvres. Une spectatrice indique ainsi « Je ne peux plus dire que Shakespeare me ferait fuir, à coup sûr je ne peux plus le dire, parce que là, vraiment, j'ai apprécié. » Pour d'autres, cependant, malgré leur plaisir à voir le spectacle, celui-ci n'a pas suscité un profond intérêt pour la pièce de Shakespeare. La peur de ne pas comprendre reste tenace. Une spectatrice m'indique ainsi, quand je lui demande si elle serait prête à aller voir Hamlet dans une version non abrégée, « Non, il faut être modeste, il faut être réaliste ». L'impact de ces formats réduits n'est donc pas le même pour tous, mais on observe néanmoins qu'ils ont rendu plus accessible une œuvre que le public visé, en tout cas en partie, ne serait de toute façon pas allé voir au théâtre auparavant. Les versions abrégées du texte de Shakespeare nous interrogent ainsi de multiples façons. Peut-on toujours parler de Shakespeare quand ces pièces sont, en partie ou totalement, vidées de leur langage et privées de leur poésie S'agit-il d'un genre à part qu'il faudrait étudier indépendamment de sa relation au texte original L'opposition entre culture élitiste et populaire qui sous-tend le format des Shakespeare Court implique en tout cas un rapport conflictuel avec l'œuvre canonique du barbe. On pourrait redouter que ce type d'adaptation solidifie la frontière entre deux publics, avec d'un côté un divertissement populaire abrégé, de l'autre la représentation solennelle d'une œuvre classique dans son intégralité. Les spectateurs, même si ces formes réduites peuvent leur donner confiance, ne migrent pas forcément d'un genre à l'autre. À l'inverse, des habitués du théâtre de Shakespeare ont pu exprimer lors d'autres enquêtes de terrain se méfier des adaptations de Shakespeare et chercher avant tout la fidélité au texte. Ces deux visions sont-elles alors irréconciliables Ces formats courts sont révélateurs de ce que note Lawrence Levine, à savoir le divorce de Shakespeare et du monde de la culture populaire. Deux instances que le théâtre abrégé cherche pourtant à réconcilier. Le contexte dans lequel ces deux spectacles ont été joués est aussi à prendre en compte. Au Festival Théâtre sur un plateau, une pièce de Shakespeare est proposée tous les ans. Et si une partie du public évite d'aller voir cette pièce par crainte de ne pas comprendre, une autre partie était bien présente à la fois pour La Tempête, jouée dans le cadre de l'édition 2023, et pour Le Hamlet en 30 minutes. De même, le festival Shakespeare Nights proposait le lendemain de 10 Horatio une représentation de Hamlet non abrégée. Le contexte festivalier permettrait ainsi de réunir, au moins en partie, deux types de publics et de réduire la distance qui les sépare. Merci pour votre écoute. Chris is director of the Tikinia Chakat Center, to guarantee the pronunciation, and professor of English in the School of Literature, Language and Media at the University of Witwatersrand. He's co-editor of Global Shakespeare and Social Injustice Toward the Transformative Encounter. Uh, published in 2023 with Sandra Young. And he's the editor of South African Essays on Universal Shakespeare, published in 2015, and of 13 volumes of the journal Shakespeare in Southern Africa. Among his other books, um, I could mention, I'd like to mention Guy Butler, The Assessing of the South African Literary Life, published in 2010. Text Bites, an anthology for high school 2009, and two collections of arts journalism at large, reviewing the arts in South Africa 2012, and still at large, dispatches from South Africa's frontiers of politics and art 2017. He's president of the Shakespeare Society of Southern Africa and founder of Shakespeare's LA, 
which is a website. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> thanks very much. I, I was wondering about that. So the hidden paper today is the title Small South Africa Shakespeare's. Sorry, let me start again. Small South African Shakespeare's on screen. Thank you very much for the glory to yours. Sorry. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, thank you to all of you, especially to our organizers. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. It's been a wonderful gathering. And I hope when I come back in the future, I can present my paper in French. But uh, for this year, it will be in English. So coming from a country like South Africa, there's a risk that uh, one always wants to think of Shakespeare in big terms, nation, race, equality, uh, injustice, and so on. Um, but reading the call for papers for this conference, uh, it struck me that much of my work over the last 10 years has really been with small Shakespeare's, um, fragments, uh, micro Shakespeare's, mini Shakespeare's, bits and pieces of Shakespeare. Um, and I think this is a function of the fact that that's really the form in which Shakespeare tends to exist in South Africa. Um, so so that, uh, Shakespeare is a, a fixture in, in education, of course, a common point of reference in popular culture and public discourse. But when it comes to stage and screen productions, it's ultimately a, a marginal presence. Uh, there are, of course, a number of full scale stage productions each year and during productions. Uh, and these are usually connected to education. They're seen as a, a means to sort of get bums on seats via uh, learners who can then do well in their exams. Uh, which is not a particularly virtuous circle. Uh, but there are still funding challenges and problems of, of scale and scope with stage productions. When it comes to filming material, there really is very, very little. And so this is something that I'm committed to uh, changing. I'm not a filmmaker. Um, I uh, am supposed to be producing these by the rate of about 10 a year. That's sort of technically what I'm paid to do. Um, translations of Shakespeare into South African languages. Afrikaans, if anybody would like one. Um, <laughs> But we've only done three in two years, primarily because I've been working with a filmmaker. Um, so, uh, yeah, my interest in, uh, in Shakespeare on screen comes from, um, from that uh, background. And I'll be talking a little bit about projects that I've been involved in today. But first, uh, I want to go back to 2013 and a conference like this one that was held at the University of Ferrara in Italy, um, organized by the late uh, Mariangela Tempera and her colleagues, called Shakespeare in Tatters. It's a very useful paradigm, I think, for thinking about how Shakespeare exists in South Africa in fragmentary forms, borrowed and, and adapted in uh, popular culture. Uh, and I presented a paper at that conference on a film called Otello Burning, which is actually a film about black surfers under apartheid, uh, based on uh, historical uh, reality, one could say, um, and has very little at all to do with Othello. Uh, but the filmmakers borrowed little bits and pieces uh, from, I guess we could think of the broader, maybe the school level themes of, of Othello, uh, sexual jealousy, uh, a friend who's actually an enemy who deceives you, that sort of thing. Um, but it's probably not inaccurate to say that this is the most recent uh, feature length uh, work that has some kind of Shakespearean inflection that is South Africa. And even prior to that, over the 10 or 20 years before that, probably only a handful of, of similar works. Um, so everything else really is small Shakespeare, small Shakespeare's on screen. Sorry, my notes are on my phone, so I have to bring them up this way. Um, okay, so uh, let's fast forward a few years to COVID um, and uh, an initiative that the Shakespeare Society of Southern Africa uh, was involved in. Uh, lockdown Shakespeare, of course, there were lockdown Shakespeare's all over the world. Um, ours took the form of a monologue, not really a competition, so much as a sort of open platform. South African theatre makers who were stuck at home recorded themselves uh, performing a monologue. Uh, we submitted it, or they submitted it to us. We created a YouTube channel. We paid them a very small sum of money for it, but it felt like it was helping to keep uh, theatre and the performing arts in South Africa going under lockdown. Um, the result was this really interesting bank, which is now about 50 strong, of monologue performances. And Henry Bell from the University of the West of Scotland, writing in a review for Shakespeare Bulletin, made two interesting points about this that are worth bearing in mind for the material I'll be talking about later. Um, first is that surprisingly few uh, actors chose to perform Shakespeare in translation into South African languages. So it's mostly an English uh, performance uh, resource, I guess we could say. Um, 
And the second is the tension between those performances which are uh, have visual context, and whether that is in, in an indoor, mostly uh, domestic interior setting or, or a different context, uh, or whether they are visually context free. Uh, and that's a, um, a dynamic that I want to apply to my discussion of some of the other uh, material. But I suppose uh, lockdown Shakespeare's in South Africa, and um, certainly as far as my own work is concerned, and the actors that I've been working with, uh, emphasize the kind of sub sub genre of the self recorded uh, monologue, you know, a small Shakespeare of two or three minutes length at most. Um, and, uh, and it's out of that that the following project grew. Uh, which was working with a South African community theatre group called Johannesburg Awakening Minds. Um, this group uh, had developed a repertoire of their own of uh, Shakespeare monologues, some of them in translation into African languages, um, and a set of scenes from A Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, which were the rude mechanical scenes. Now, of course, this group of performers uh, has been described in terms of the paradigm of Scapegoat's homeless Shakespeare. Um, and so, in a way, there's a wonderful irony in them performing uh, the root mechanical scenes um, for audiences, knowing that those audiences already are assuming to condescend towards them as inferior uh, theatre makers. Um, and so what we did uh, with them was to uh, produce a series called Jam at the Windy Brow. The Windy Brow is uh, a, a theatre complex in South Africa where they um, uh, have a, a kind of rehearsal space. So very specifically, uh, also it's site-specific work. Um, and, uh, and that was a series of, of monologues, which is also uh, available via YouTube. And then we ventured into A Midsummer Ice Cream, which is the, um, the mechanicals material from uh, Midsummer Night's Stream. Um, so again, different versions of uh, small Shakespeare's on screen. And all of these things led, from my perspective anyway, um, towards the project Speaking a Speech. I began working at the end of 2022 with a, a filmmaker and director, Victor van Asverven, who's the figure you see in the white t-shirt on the right-hand side there. Um, and uh, together we envisaged a project that would involve uh, up to 35 monologues that would be available on an online platform um, in South Africa's 11 or 12, depending on who you ask, official languages uh, other than English. Um, so an ambitious project that was also, we still uh, is going to, we hope will lead to a kind of documentary uh, feature. So we're calling it a documentary feature in development. What that really means is we need 100,000 euros. So if you know anybody who has the means, then uh, they can send it our way and we'll, we'll complete the material. So far, we only have uh, five monologues and two of those are what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so these, these monologues are small. Uh, because each is a short film, which is a kind of bite-sized Shakespeare that stands on its own. Uh, but also we hope in the, in the wider project with some behind the scenes interview material with actors, um, we'll also uh, not acquire context related to the play that it comes from, uh, but um, to uh, the actor's life. So it's really about South African actors finding a voice, sometimes through Shakespeare, sometimes despite Shakespeare. Uh, and it's a language advocacy project uh, primarily. Uh, there to promote South African languages via Shakespeare. Um, it's small because it's uh, low budget, as I've indicated, uh, small scale, uh, also small in terms of the filming setup. So that image on the right hand side, um, it's not the, cam the angle of the camera that makes it seem small. That's really a tiny stage at a small theater called the Drama Factory in Somerset West, uh, near where I live. Um, and uh, on the right hand side, there are a group of plastic chairs. Uh, and on the left hand side, um, there is a screen and that's it. So it's uh, it's very small. Uh, it's a crew of two, Victor and myself, uh, and the actors who are involved. Um, so this really is kind of small scale uh, Shakespeare on screen. But it's also small because we hope that uh, although the material is beautifully filmed and the cinematography that uh, Victor has um, produced is, is wonderful, uh, it's unlikely that it will be seen on large screens. We had a preview screening at a um, Arts Festival last year on a big screen, it was beautiful, but our hope really is that this will mostly be seen on small screens. So uh, I suppose thinking primarily with a younger audience in mind, uh, people sharing via their phones on social media, and hopefully encountering these performances as monologues that they don't initially identify as Shakespearean. So when they encounter the monologue, it's simply somebody speaking in a language that the, that the viewer speaks 
Uh, and if they happen to know that it's Shakespeare, that's fine, but we almost prefer that they don't. Um, but uh, anticipating that in multilingual South Africa, uh, many viewers will need a little bit of help. Um, there are three versions, three subtitled versions of each uh, video available on the, on the site. And it comes with the subtitle text available. You can kind of scroll through different uh, options. So there is the um, Scapegoat Shakespeare in original. Uh, then there is the language being spoken by the performer. And then there is a kind of modern English or contemporary English version, um, which uh, is sometimes provided by the performer or the translator that they worked with. Um, and sometimes uh, is uh, a kind of accepted version of an already familiar South African translation. I'll talk about those complications just now. Uh, but those are the four actors that we've uh, worked with so far. Annalisa Pewa um, on the top uh, left uh, and Bukhle Ngaba on the bottom right are the two that you will see uh, today. Um, and then Royston Stoffels on the top right and Chantal Stanfield are our other two uh, performers. So um, these are uh, very much removed from visual context. And so uh, because they're lacking in the contextual detail that might come from props or backdrop or other visual markers of place and time, um, the uh, linguistic or the textual detail is key. Um, so in the terms of the, the corporate papers for the conference, I want to suggest that each speaking and speech performance contains a moment within the moment of the speech itself, which has been lifted out of the play in which it occurs, but carries traces of perhaps that play's wider narrative of thematic arcs. Um, it contains a moment in which, and here I'm quoting from the Falkel papers, minimal changes to words or details in the text uh, have the potential to profoundly reframe the ways in which viewers or listeners engage with the Shakespearean material. In one sense, this is an inevitable function of translation, but I hope to show how in the speak mere speech monologues being discussed, these subtle uh, shifts are culturally historically and politically significant. So let me play the first one. How am I doing for time? Was that about 10 minutes? Oh. Okay, good. Um, the, the sound, I'm going to play it three times. It's a 40 second clip. So you can see the three sets of subtitles. The sound on the first one is not great. I apologize. Sorry. I was uh, now going to correct myself, correcting myself. I was about to give you context. Imagine uh, that you're not seeing this uh, as a speech from Julius Caesar. I suppose that's our hope. Uh, but given that this is a Shakespearean audience, <laughs> just to clarify, this is um, Portia's speech to uh, Brutus, uh, to scene one of Julius Caesar, uh, in which Portia is appealing to Brutus to let her in on the, the secret of the conspirators so that she can uh, be part, I suppose, of public life in Rome, but also uh, more intimate and closer to her husband. Apologies to Bootley for interrupting her. She would say that is typical of. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. You've got the um let's jump, we've jumped one. So that was the uh the sits one or something. Okay, scratch that. We'll start again. Here we go. I can't play the um So we all recognize that, I imagine. Um, now I'm going to play for you uh, the Setswana translation. This comes from uh, the famous Sol Plaiki translation uh, that was published in 1937, but Plaiki probably did the translation about 15 years before that, possibly more. Um, Plaiki was the first person to have a full translation of Shakespeare, Shakespeare into an African language published. Um, although, depending on um, how you attribute dates to certain 
Yoruba translations in Nigeria in the 1930s, like you might lose the title. South Africans like to say uh, this is the, the first translation published into an African language. Um, and because of Plaiki's uh, political credentials, he was a co-founding member of the African National Congress. Um, he uh, was uh, a, a journalist, a striding critic of um, land appropriation, land theft in the colonial context. In a way that complicates things, he was also a kind of apologist for the British Empire, uh, a very complicated figure, but a really interesting one. Um, and in a way, many South African Shakespeareans have written on Plaiki's coattails, uh, simply to say, because Shakespeare was of interest to Plaiki, he is therefore of interest to us. And so it's not an easy relationship. But that is the uh, preface I wanted to give you to the Setswana version. well, I'll be stretching your patience if I play you the contemporary subtitles. Um, it's 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 uh, serving a point that I will come to you in the next slide. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> Yes, I'm very gratified that some of you noted the uh, shoot myself in the foot. Um, I, uh, uh, I want to mention here that Bushden Gaba, the performer, um, uh, has a significant family relationship to a particular copy of Pikey's translation that her grandmother passed down to her. And for Bushden, this represents a kind of to use a slightly contested phrase, an indigenous South, South African indigenous South African. Uh, Shakespeare that really belongs to her family before it belongs to any other kind of cultural context. Um, and that's important because uh, this play in particular, um, where a figure like Portia or Porosia and the Plaiki translation is kind of marginalized from the public sphere, um, speaks to Ngaba's own sense of women in her family from previous generations uh, who were involved in the struggle against apartheid, but at the same time, it's been kind of idealized into what is called the Mbokoro figure, the, the, the stone, the rock, you know, who shall not be moved. Um, many of these women have been, uh, if not scratched from the record, at least sidelines and narratives about uh, South Africa's political history. And so Porosha, in some ways, is voicing a much uh, wider, dare I say, bigger um, uh, complaint here. Okay, so just to say, uh, going back to Rob's presentation of the other day, and um, this is what the Plaiki text looks like in the 1937 version. You can see it uh, doesn't have um, uh, verse lines. Um, so uh, I hope you won't mind that I um, tried to reproduce that and the trilingual version of the, um, of the website in this slide. Um, so, uh, yes, we have there um, Buchle and Gaba and the, and the translator she was working with, a, a Plaiki expert, Sabato and Paul Mokai, um, their desire to express or to use the phrase, I shot myself in the foot as a translation of Plaiki's English. Now, it's worth mentioning here that Plaiki was trying to recuperate what he saw as a disappearing idiomatic version of Setswana that because of increased urbanization in South Africa at the beginning of the 20th century um, was, uh, was becoming thinned out. Uh, and so it was already dated in a sense when he produced the translation. 
And so now it's kind of doubly dated because a contemporary Setswana speaker would find it very difficult, as we say in South Africa, deep Setswana to access. Um, and so uh, Bush's understanding here, along with Sabata, who, who collaborator, um, is that most contemporary Setswana speakers, particularly young people, would probably want to listen to this Setswana with the contemporary English subtitles to make sense of it. So in a sense, what we have here is the actor, not just as translator and adapter and interpreter, we also have the actor as editor, to go back to the paradigm that uh, Rob cited as well. Um, and so with Bush's permission, I want to trouble slightly the, the gesture that, um, that she and Sabata performed in that translation um, by looking at some of the Setswana. I'm not a Setswana speaker, but uh, uh, we have enough to go on here. Um, so uh, itlava is the, uh, the root verb to stab, stabbing oneself. So itlava um, ntoya lelu mo more um, I stab myself uh, um, with the spear uh, in the foot. So leoto, the leg, so leoto, if like he wanted to say uh, leg, he could have used a different word. He uses lekoto, lekoto. Um, but the next line um, actually reads uh, where it says, Ankarwala nto mosero pe capelo etelele. I can carry that wound that I have in my thigh uh, with persistence or perseverance for a long time. So there's a kind of circular language here from Plaki where he refers to the foot, uh, stabbing in the foot, but also refers to the wound in the thigh, which of course is the kind of classical figure of Porsche's um, mention of her own uh, stoical you know, uh, ability uh, to, to, uh, to suffer. But the, the point really that uh, Butler wanted to make in the speech was that Porsche or Porosha has resigned herself to a marginalized public role. She's given up on uh, what should be her right as a public political Roman figure. Uh, and she did that the day that she married Brutus and shot herself in the foot. And so her appeal becomes a much more an appeal simply from a wife to a husband uh, for some kind of intimacy because she'd given up on, on uh, the um, public role. Um, and that is allowed or perhaps justified by the idiomatic use of clava, um, in various different phrases. So for example, most commonly it would be used uh, in contemporary language, uh, which is to sort of choose to suffer in silence when you could say something. Um, and so, uh, so, it's, so, so Bushle and Sabata, by taking Plaiki's dated Setswana and making it and condensing it into the phrase, I shot myself in the foot, um, are both uh, kind of collapsing a more complicated syntactical structure on Plaiki's part, but with justification, I think, um, condensing it into a, a, a much more explicit contemporary English rendering of, of what is happening. Um, so uh, that is uh, Bushle. Do I have time for a shorter version? I've I run out, that's fine. So all I will say is I'll recommend to you to uh, look at this uh, speech, which is uh, Annelisa Pewa and Nisi Zulu doing Thomas Moore. Um, and uh, encourage you to look at the trilingual text uh, in which he takes the idea of being dehumanized, the famous mountainish inhumanity of the Thomas More speech, which of course is partly Shakespearean, um, uh, and uh, removes the concluding phrase, uh, mountainish inhumanity, replaces it with a South African idiom about hands washing one another, a very well-known idiom about a shared humanity. Having changed some of the metaphors earlier in the speech uh, to ensure that in this kind of request for uh, um, mutual recognition of one another's humanity as a challenge to xenophobia, both the anti-immigrant and the immigrant uh, are um, dehumanized through uh, animal imagery. Um, so that is uh, really all I want to do is to encourage you to uh, look at more of these uh, and to say thank you very much. Uh, I'm not trying to make any grand claims for this project. In fact, the claims are very modest and small, but slowly but surely, we hope in small pieces, and uh, we clearly see the way that South Africa figures, or Shakespeare figures in a South African context. Thank you. Um, right. Let's move on to our third speaker. Who's Amy Lister? 
Amy's a department lecturer in English literature and language at Jesus College, Oxford. Um, her research is in Shakespeare, early modern drama, book history, and historiography. And her work has appeared widely in ethnic collections and journals. Um, she's had a very busy couple of years. She's the author of Publishing the History Play in the Time of Shakespeare's Station is Faithing the Genre, published with TUP in 2022. Wartime Shakespeare, Performing Narratives of Conflict, TUP 2023. And her next monograph, Authorship and Authority in Early Modern Dramatic Text, is forthcoming with Fort with Radcliffe. She's also co-edited the collection Shakespeare at War, a material history published in 2023, again with Cambridge University Press with Sonia Masai. And she's preparing the introduction to the new Oxford Waltz, Waltz Classics edition of the first part of Henry VI. Today, her paper is entitled Shakespeare in Fragments, Performances at Rulebin Internal Camp During the First World War. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I, I'm really thrilled to be part of this uh, panel and and, um, and my paper is also going to continue to look at ideas of um, Shakespeare in fragments of small Shakespeare, um, but going uh, back in time a little bit to the, uh, the First World War. So during the First World War, about five and a half thousand civilians were imprisoned at Ruben internment camp in Germany on the site of a converted race course. The internment of enemy civilians living in belligerent countries was widespread during the First World War, owing to a fear they would assist the war effort of their country of origin. And internment took place on an unprecedented scale. Matthew Stibbe estimates that between 1914 and 1918, at least 300,000 enemy civilians were deported and or interned in Western and Central Europe, a further 300,000 in the Russian Empire, and probably around 50,000 to 100,000 in the rest of the world. Civilians held in these camps developed their own micro-societies, which at Rulliburn included a university, magazine, sporting clubs, art exhibitions, and dramatic societies. In this slide, you can see internees queuing for a performance at the camp theater. As Ton Heinzler's detailed work on the camp has shown, Shakespeare became one of the spokesmen for the internees. The camp theater performed plays, including Twelfth Night and As You Like It, in shortened texts. Some lectures offered through the camp's university took Shakespeare as their subject, and the camp's own English periodicals in Rulevin Camp and the Rulevin Camp magazine occasionally featured Shakespeare-related articles and quotations. Uh, for example, one item here uh, called uh, Shakespeare, Kruzka Banana, or Prisoner of War, applied short extracts from the plays to aspects of camp life, reflecting the period's penchant for commonplacing Shakespeare. At the bottom of this example, printed under the heading The Day of Days, which refers to the long-awaited day of release from the camp, one quotation used two lines from Macbeth, stand not upon the order of your going, but go at once. These lines were also used on this 1915 enlistment poster in Britain, but with a very different imperative to persuade civilians to enlist. In both cases, the lines were removed from their context within the play when Lady Macbeth instructs her guests to leave the banquet after Macbeth becomes distracted by Banquo's ghost. Shakespeare functions as a recognisable cultural figurehead whose works can be taken out of context and acquire new meanings. Within Rubin's micro-society, Shakespeare always exists in fragments. Productions in the Camp Theatre used shortened texts, and the Camp magazine drew on lines and isolated speeches within the plays that were repurposed to apply to this new temporary wartime society. These short forms sometimes had a practical explanation. The limited resources of internment meant that texts needed to be abridged for performance, but Shakespeare's fragmented presence has wider significance. The selection of extracts, speeches, and scenes to use a perform uh, testifies to Shakespeare's cultural capital and as I hope to show, implies a certain kind of narrative about what Shakespeare is assumed to signify for internees. And the use of short texts and extracts can also construct and intensify new interpretations within the camp setting, often when his works are taken out of context and adapted. 
In the first part of my talk, I'll give a few examples of small Shakespeare within Rulivo that demonstrate these two points. And then in the second part, I'll consider two further stages of Shakespeare's fragmentation in the camp in terms of appeal and evidence. Shakespeare was not to everyone's liking, uh, but the evidence of these dissenting views within the camp, as well as the short forms and texts used, are limited by documentary loss and the nature of survival materials and testimonies from which critics extrapolate wider claims. Centralizing Shakespeare can actually deflect attention away from the diversity of the camp's demographics and the transnational range of writers performed at the camp theatre and used in its magazines. <laughs> Rudiman's short forms and commentaries about Shakespeare have a practical explanation, but they also construct a narrative about the dramatist's position within the camp and the interpretation of the texts, performances, and materials that were created and circulated. The camp theatre was a central aspect of community life. Internee Archibald Welland, who was held in Rudiman for three and a half years, claimed, claimed that it reached such dazzling heights, unknown perhaps to any other theatre, because of the important function it served. How useful its work was is testified by all who saw it. To my mind, it was the greatest organization in the camp, certainly one that did the greatest amount of good in as much as for a few hours each week, the interned could go there, forget their internment. Welland invested much of his time in captivity as a producer, designer of costumes and scenery, an actor in the Count's productions, including this 1915 adaptation of As You Like It, which was directed by fellow internee Cecil Duncan Jones. Abridged versions of Shakespeare's plays were especially prominent in the tercentenary year that marked the 300th anniversary of Shakespeare's death. A special committee chaired by A.C. Ford arranged a Shakespeare festival from April 16, uh, 1916 that included scenes from Twelfth Night, and Othello, a concert of Shakespearean music, and a series of lectures about Shakespeare's England. A printed programme was prepared for the occasion, which featured on its final page a dedication to internees. This festival was offered to the subjects of the British Empire interned at Rulibum as a tercentenary commemoration that cannot be without special significance to all who reverence the ideals that spring from English soil and live in the English tongue. While Rudiman was officially styled as a camp, an English camp that held uh, British civilians, it was more accurately, as internee Israel Cohen puts it, a miniature cosmopolis that interned civilians from across the British Empire and beyond. The Tercentenary Festival aimed to boost the morale and patriotic sympathies of those interned in Rudiman by suggesting their shared ownership of Shakespeare and their participation in as some sort the superior ideas and language of his works. There is something exclusionary in the festival's dedication, which suggests that subjects of the wider British empire are indebted to the cultural contributions of England and the English language, establishing through the familiar autonomy, a hierarchy that subordinates Scottish, Welsh and Irish identities, while also overlooking the presence of other civilians from the British empire and beyond. The short forms used within this festival and the materials that survive but it position Shakespeare as a benevolent figurehead for empire and anticipate an improving response from internees. The importance of Shakespeare within the camp is also suggested by an arts and crafts exhibition held two months later in June 1916 that featured dolls or figurines of the characters from Twelfth Night and Othello and provided internees with the opportunity to purchase a memento of these productions. These same productions were also useful for camp authorities. German officials were, as Matthew Stibbys describes, more than willing to advertise Rulibin culture as an example of the Reich's supposedly humane treatment of prisoners and as a means of countering allied atrocity propaganda. Contemporary reports and photographs of the tercentenary performances appeared in a number of periodicals, including the Times, and create the impression that internees could enjoy cultural pursuits and that their living conditions were comfortable. Materials that passed outside the camp, such as internees' correspondence, were vetted by camp officials and deemed suitable for what would possibly become an international public readership. For example, this enthusiastic letter dated uh, 26th of April 1916 from attorney Walter Butterworth to Sir Alexander Porter was printed one month later in the Manchester Guardian. 
We are having a Shakespeare commemoration week just now. I tell you, it is a real achievement. Twelve nights, Othello, Elizabethan concert, and lectures on Shakespeare's England. It was really wonderful what the boys did with Twelfth Night. We have many young fellows, often from the public schools and universities. They are usually fine young athletes, smooth-skinned and active as wild deer. We watch them in the morning playing soccer, rugby, hockey, etc. Then in the evening, we admire them in plays this week, Shakespeare. Blurring the boundary between private and public communication, Butterworth's short selective account serves two different sets of opposing aims. It could be taken as evidence that life in the camp is relaxed, satisfying and edifying, something like a temporary retreat from normal life, which could function as uh, pro-German propaganda and help to counter the reports of appalling living conditions in the camp. But two, it also establishes an image of the British internees as upbeat, industrious and undaunted about the ordeal of wartime imprisonment. Shakespearean performances in the camp tend to be designed with explicit dual aim of entertainment and education, in the sense of offering an edifying repertory of serious plays. While plays were abridged, it does not seem that productions were adapted to reflect directly on the First World War and internees' experiences of captivity. But other short forms, such as extracted lines or adapted speeches that were printed within the camp's magazine, did use Shakespeare for this purpose. One main example is this adaptation by internee Ali Fillmore of the Seven Ages of Man uh, speech from As You Like It. It doesn't retain any of Shakespeare's lines in full, but preserves the structure of the speech, while also making syntactical choices that recall the original. All the world's a cage, and all the men within it weary players. They have no exits, only entrances, where each spends many months ere he departs. In place of a progressive account of the life of man from birth through adulthood to old age and death, we have here the life of an attorney at Rulabun from arrival at the camp, the newcomer, through different stages of dealing with internment as a student, camp's university, a lover writing home, a captain who aims to uphold duty and discipline within the camp, and ends with the attorney who has lost everything, is without these enthusiasms and can do nothing but wait for the day of release. And last of all, before we drop the curtain upon the scene where life is so uncertain, comes he who patient waits upon the stage, nor uninstructed seeks to read the page, well knowing that day will come when he will once again be numbered with free, resigned to all each passing day he views, sans cash, sans clothes, sans liberty, Sans views. In this example, Shakespeare's text offers a malleable rhetorical template for building this parallel, but clearly distinctive reflection on the experience of wartime imprisonment. The structure and progression of Shakespeare's original intensifies the interpretation of the stages of imprisonment here. While conveying a sense of resilience and anticipating the day of release, the adapted text creates a connection between the conclusion of this speech in death and what happens to someone after prolonged captivity, becoming a kind of blank who is left with nothing. The impression we might get from these short forms is that Shakespeare was a central cultural figure with widespread appeal and through whom internees reflected on their experiences of wartime captivity. In this second part of my talk, I'll draw attention to limitations both in Shakespeare's appeal and in documentary evidence that shapes our understanding of the camp's cultural life. Despite Shakespeare's appeal for some internees and officials, he was a disputed figure for others in the camp. In the first instance, his plays were not actually used or staged very often. Surviving repertory details and theatre programmes reveal that most productions coincide roughly with St George's Day and the anniversary of Shakespeare's death and birth, and the breaks in the repertory schedule suggest, as internee Israel Cohen points out, that Shakespeare did not appeal to the majority. His plays were sometimes described in the Cat magazine as too highbrow, as educational rather than entertaining. As two uh, former internees, Joseph Powell and Francis Scribble, recall, one group of men looked to the theatre only for amusement. To another group, it was the most serious of all the arts and the handmaid of the churches and the schools. The latter were ridiculed by the former as supermen. 
The choice of the word Superman alludes to Nietzsche's concept of the Übermensch and is used to describe internees who prize serious drama such as Shakespeare and they consider themselves superior to others, taking on a self-appointed task of educating the camp and imposing their own tastes on them. A few internees express their misgivings in the camp magazine. Hurley or Hersey argues that the theatre should be a medium of entertainment and amusement and should not overtax the leniency shown by a considerate camp. Some internees reportedly asked the entertainments committee to, quote, give them two nights a week without any entertainments so they could sit and enjoy the hall in silence, quote. Looking back to the tercentenary program, the production of the Thado warrants further consideration within the context of the camp setting. Shakespeare's tragedy is propelled by its setting and military context. A group of men on a wartime mission find themselves disbanded within Cyprus with unstructured time on their hands, and tensions, anxieties, and racial discriminations escalate within this unfamiliar environment. Civilians imprisoned in Rulivan were similarly confined within an unfamiliar setting that was far from home, and one marked by the potential for tragedy, including ill health, maltreatment by camp authorities, and the outbreak of conflict among internees. The tercentenary production of Othello seems, on the one hand, designed to celebrate Shakespeare as a unifying touchstone for internees, but on the other hand, this production draws attention to the possibility and threat of growing tensions within the confined camp setting. It is also one that furthers that tension through its presentation in the tercentenary programme and through staging practices. The part of Othello was performed by H.G. Hopkirk in blackface, as shown in this production that passed outside the camp and was printed in the graphic. Rudman itself had a significant black population, but these internees were segregated from the others, initially in Barrack 13 and later in Barrack 21. They were excluded from many of the cultural activities within the camp, although they developed their own society centered around the Barrack. Sylvester Leon, a Jamaican actor who had been studying drama in Germany and regularly performed in Shakespearean productions before the outbreak of war, um, was held there, and as, as, as Frank Stockel, another attorney, recalls, he was the finest actor we had, but he was seldom seen outside his barrack, as even then the colour bar was his greatest obstacle, end quote. As part of the Tercentenary Festival put on by the main dramatic society, Othello's racial prejudices are echoed by the very performance context of this production that subordinated the participation of others within the camp. At Rudiman, Shakespeare had, therefore, a divided appeal. Some attorneys approved of his plays, while others felt that performances were too highbrow or appealing, or were ill-suited to the condition and limited resources of internment. Because of the difficulty in keeping personal records of life at Rudiman, accounts of Shakespeare's use and the theatre's reception are distorted in favour of those which German authorities deemed accept acceptable and advantageous to pass outside the camp, and those written retrospectively by released internees. These memoirs were overwhelmingly written by the upper to middle class internees, the public schoolboys whom Walter Butterworth singled out above others in the camp. These individuals tend to be firm advocates of an edifying repertory of serious plays. But when looking beyond a few examples, few examples of Shakespearean productions at Rulliman, performance records reveal a European repertory. The main dramatic society staged a number of plays by Ibsen, by Chekhov, Tristan Bernard, um, and others. And the camp had separate Irish, French, and German dramatic societies. Camp demographics were diverse and included internees from different nationalities, classes, ethnicities, and religions, which sharply contrast with the uniformity of voices among the relevant memoirists and their accounts of Shakespeare. Rulibanites established their own micro-society, but it was not a homogenous one in which Shakespeare occupied an assured position. Most of the government narratives constitute a significant proportion of our documentary evidence about life in camp, and in several of these, rhetorically built notions, clear-cut national identities, were used to emphasize lines of division and difference, with Shakespeare often playing a key role in this process. Rubel, when reflecting on the psychological suffering that sometimes leading to suicide that was endured by internees, claimed that it was, quote, gratifying to observe that the weakest vessels were those who had the least English blood in their veins and were most indebted for their education to German culture, end quote. 
He evaluates his fellow internees on the basis of their national origins, class, and education, and claims approvingly that, quote, the most cheery were those who had been in English public schools, end quote. Uh, the others, again, another quote on the slide, the others wandered about like lost dogs, though some of them had the grace to express admiration for the greater energy of their companions in misfortune. You English, one of them said to me, seemed to set to work as if you were founding the new colony. Rubel relishes this, this comment and the colonizing initiatives of the English, and echoing Butterworth, see the pure-blooded, public school-educated English as among the superior camp members. Much surviving evidence about the theatre and pastimes at Rulibone relies on accounts from individuals such as Rubel and others of a similar background. While the camp's diverse demographics and the position of other dramatists within the theatrical repertory indicate the importance of transnational and European identities, Shakespeare seems to the claims of his most vocal users to be firmly mobilized as a national English icon or as a figure of professed universal appeal that is used paradoxically to advance the superiority of English culture and language. In summary, then, internees at Louisville created a micro society in which short forms and abridged productions of Shakespeare played an important role for some on the camp. These short forms were often adapted in response to the wartime context, sometimes in a way that might expand our understanding of Shakespeare's work. The staging of a fellow in a captive wartime setting could resonate with and intensify the events in the play. In other cases, they might depart significantly from the original content and context of Shakespeare's work, as in the adaptation of the Seven Ages of Man, that speech from As You Like It. But in this paper, I aim to draw attention, uh, equal attention to the methodological complexities of understanding cultural life in Rulibum and the position of Shakespeare within it. Cultural historians work in clues or details about the use and reception of Shakespeare to extrapolate wider theories and conclusions. The history of Shakespeare in Rulibum demonstrates its textuality insofar as the survival and construction of this history is bound to fragmented material documents that determine our access to the past. In Rulibon, surviving documents are weighted in favor of memoirs and records made by upper and middle class internees and those materials that officials deemed acceptable to circulate more widely. But alternative histories are visible within and between these documents. Wartime conditions and narrativizing strategies are often aimed to construct a cohesive account of the purpose and significance of the arts during wartime, and in this process, acts of forgetting and elision have played important roles. We need to be attentive to this loss because without that recognition, uh, we can end up distorting Shakespeare's appeal, use, and reception, as well as looking for clues and drawing from surviving documentary evidence. It's vital to look for clues about what does not survive, what has been lost, forgotten, or minimized, and to bring these histories into our work too. Thank you very much. No, I mean, it's been fantastic papers. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions or comments. I actually didn't start to raise my hand first. Thank you. That was a wonderful panel. Um, I just have a comment that links. Amy's at Chris's uh, paper, I think. Um, it's just a personal comment. My my husband is a New Zealander, and his um, great grand uncle was uh, cycling in Germany on a cycling holiday uh, from from New Zealand in World War One and was interned. And we have in the family a photo of um, a performance of Merchant of Venice in Maori. Mm -hmm. uh, so there must have been a fair number of Kiwis who had sufficient knowledge of Maori, but it's just the it was just a photograph. So um, you know, you talked about the English language, Amy, but I think maybe there's also some translation going on there as well. But thank you. I, I really enjoyed all three papers so much. So I have a quick question at the top of my head right now. Um, or for you, Amy, it's all fresh. Um, have these been reprinted from uh, today, or are these just remnants? Are they forever going to be remnants? Are they going to be edited, or uh, have they been edited yet? Project. 
Um, thank you. Um, so um, these items here um, on either side, those are um, uh, held at the Bodleian Library. Um, uh, actually, all three of these are on the Bodleian Library. So the, the, um, they're not, they don't exist in um, edited, you know, recent um, editions. Um, I've uh, published some work that includes reproductions of a couple of these. Um, and I'd like to continue to, to do that as well. Um, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm want, wanting to find out if anybody knows of, of um, similar holdings in their um, uh, institutions and, and libraries. I'd be really keen to, to hear about that. I mean, it's, it's been a process of um, uh, conducting searches, looking through catalogues, and then you end up getting a, a box of loose papers and documents and programs. Um, and it's, it's often what has been passed through, um, you know, a, say a particular attorney and, and what has what are then um, uh, eventually made its way into um, a library or collection. And it is always, it's when I've encountered them, they're always quite random, short papers, um, quite Quite literally, um, the, um, the the camp magazines um, they're more widely available. So um, the uh, the British Library had digitised, although it's not accessible at the moment, but they had digitised most of um, the the two years' work of magazines. So those could be looked at online. Um, but a lot of this material is just in in archival boxes. One thing that really, I mean, to sort of carry on the conversation, one thing that really strikes me is that they have impressed and impressive that mm -hmm. they were printing in the camp or? It was outside, I think. Uh, yeah. But they're all three very different. I mean, they're not being printed in the same place or by the same people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the in the middle, this one is uh, part of the, the magazine, and then these ones on either side are like playbills, uh, so advertising the performances. Um, yeah, the production printing didn't take place within the camp itself, but the, there was a kind of cooperation to, to get the, the material uh, printed. Thank you very much for the papers. Um, we Many have a question for you or a comment, I suppose. By the way, I saw uh, an even more rich version of Hamlet, but reverse with um, Gertrude spitting into the glass uh, at the end of the night at like three minutes at uh, an Edinburgh festival. But your, your uh, research reminds me of Jean Dasté. You know, you've heard of him? Oh. Uh, Jean Dasté had a marvelous, uh, a marvelous director who had he wanted to bring not Shakespeare, but he did bring Shakespeare. But he wanted to bring a theatre to to people, and he uh, he, he was in a kind of circus, in a kind of circus tent, and they were beautiful, they were absolutely beautiful. The pictures of members of the audience, you know, they're so happy to be there. It's marvelous. And so he really, uh, there were more pictures of the audience than the actual plays, you know, the actual, so it's not that's the, uh, yeah, uh, Jean, 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 he's a very, very important person, and yes, all the family is very important. I think you should look into that, and have beautiful books about Jean Thank you. Thank you very much, I'll do that. Oh, thank you. I have a question for Lillian. So um, I want to know more about the sociology of, 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 uh, of the audience that goes to the Théâtre d'Ardemont. Uh, I have a fair idea of the sociology of the region because I grew up just on Stone Row away from uh, Ardemont. But uh, I'm wondering who does this Elizabethan theatre um, built in in France, in, in rural France, near a medium sized town, um, who does that in terms of the audience? Yes, so um, the audience is rather on the 
older spectrum, so 50 years old and older, uh, mostly retired um, people, so often older than 70, but yeah, I'd say about two thirds of the audience is older than 50. Um, they built it because they are part of the um, Alliance Cordiale, so they are also Entente. Entente, sorry. So they are also dedicating themselves to, you know, make links with the UK. Um, and so they have, I think, a big, um, you know, audience who's really interested uh, in England, Shakespeare. Um, and, you know, it's not only local local people coming to the play, uh, a lot of people just take their car and drive there for the festival, um, like Clermont sitting <laughs> next to you. Um, but yeah, it's mostly people from the region, but they also have, you know, people who are traveling because it's quite touristic uh, with the sea. It's, it's quite a beautiful capital and place. And so, um, you know, some of the audience members didn't really know that a festival was happening. They just um, walked around the castle and just happened to see that there was a play right at that time. And so they just bought a ticket on a whim and entered. Um, yeah, does that answer the question about that? Um, I was wondering in terms of cultural capital, uh, people who, who tend to go to, are they usually locals? Um, oh, well, you, you did answer that part, but are they generally educated in Shakespeare? Um, not educated in Shakespeare, no, not necessarily. Uh, but they still go to the theater, which you know is in itself um, a practice that mostly people with cultural, cultural capital uh, practice and go to. Um, yeah. So I have another question now. Uh, for Chris this time. Um, so I know we talked about, about performances, but I'm interested in what you said about the actress who was handed down in the family. One version was handed down. My grandmother was it. And so when did translations in in the that well other national languages start? It's not. Were they um, a British version? And also, did she tell you, did the actress tell you or tell anyone about her um, experience of the transmission with her grandmother? Did they play active with her grandmother? Or is it something that is actually experienced as a performance in a family? That's a great question. So, um, Mikey himself, writing about uh, his own work, alludes to existing translations of Shakespeare uh, into um, both his own language, Setswana, and uh, some other South African languages. In fact, the um, the uh, going back to the two centenary, the nineteen sixteen um, volume, uh, the homage to Shakespeare, and in which Pikey contributes, um, which in a way is an interesting phenomenon because it points to the sort of simultaneous, um, uh, you know, the the way in which that volume served, you know, the British war effort in the sense of kind of British significance, but also. Uh, is, a, is a mechanism for emphasizing a kind of multilingual uh, Shakespeare. Um, so Pleike alludes to an existing 19th century uh, tradition and, and some scholars have, uh, again, found fragments of performances at um, mission schools and, and elsewhere. So there, there is that kind of prehistory, but, but Pleike is the beginning of a, of a formal translation tradition, uh, which then continues in the 1950s, 60s and 70s into full translations into quite a few South African languages. That's complicated because they were used as part of the segregated fund to education system uh, by the project government wanting to create kind of separate tribes and therefore separate schooling systems and language language uh, using different languages of learning and teaching. Um, but in terms of this particular book, so it, it's it's more of a kind of talisman, I guess, that was passed down, um, not really within a performance tradition, 
Um, but for Ngaba, it was it was something that helped her in the process of grieving the loss of her grandmother, who'd really been a kind of maternal figure to her. Um, and it was just before, interestingly, she took up a bursary to go and spend time in Stratford with the Royal Shakespeare Company. So just before arriving, where she had expected to arrive with a sense of insecurity about her inability to do Shakespeare the proper way, um, she didn't encounter this text and suddenly thought, well, actually, Shakespeare is part of my family story and history. Um, so I, 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 one doesn't want, there's a risk that one makes too much of the story. Um, but certainly the, the physical copy of the book means a lot to her. And, and subsequently, the work that she's done, um, particularly in Setswana with other Setswana language practitioners, uh, emphasizes Plaghi's significance. Um, and, and, and attempts to, we, we all together want to try and bring those uh, texts into uh, performance, because for the most part, they are seen as books that just belong on kind of dusty library shelves rather than actually being living texts, which can be play scripts. Uh, no, no, full, full translations, yeah. It's always a pleasure for me to take part in the conference. It's been quite a stimulating one, uh, as we heard, and the theme was quite helpful, and that's been that's going to be a very interesting. Uh, Publication on uh, on the website shortly. Um, as a comparatist and an 18th century man, I'm twice pleased to chair this session because I will give talk to two Italian young scholars on Shakespeare in the 18th century. Uh, the first one, so I speak in English because they are Italian, but uh, the part of the audience is English speaking, so <laughs> I'll present them in in, uh, in English. Uh, Luisa Signorelli uh, took her degrees at the University of Catania in Sicily, and she's now doing a master, uh, a PhD in uh, London, University College. Uh, her PhD is funded by UCL and the British Federation of Women Graduates. And as her paper will approve, she's currently investigating 18th century uh, Shakespeare anthologies. Thank you. Thank you so much. So today I will uh, be giving you a summary of two chapters from my doctoral thesis, which is on Shakespeare in the 18th century anthologies. And in particular, one of the main arguments of my thesis is that throughout the 18th century, Shakespeare criticism and practice of Shakespeare, uh, reading Shakespeare shift from a fable-based neoclassical approach to uh, uh, emphasis on the emotional reaction, or sort of pre-romantic emphasis on the emotional reaction to his passages. My paper will also try to dispel some common misconceptions that are held towards the anthology, a sort of locus of decontextualization of Shakespeare, by presenting it instead as a sort of locus of transition from this uh, fable-based uh, approach to uh, this uh, emphasis on Shakespeare's passages. So, uh, like uh, all uh, people who talk about Shakespeare in the 18th century, I also would like to start with Samuel, John, Samuel Johnson's preface. In one of his most quoted passages, in his preface, Samuel Johnson states that Shakespeare's real power is not shown in the splendor of particular passages, but by the progress of his fable and the tenor of his dialogue. And he that first recommend him by select quotations will succeed like the pedant in Heracles, who, when he offered this house to sail, carried a brick in his pocket as a specimen. Here I also added uh, an image. I hope it is more useful than it is ridiculous, but here it is. <laughs> uh, of course, uh, uh, the idea of the architecture of a work of literature, of this metaphor of a work of literature in terms of a building is not really Johnson's invention. We found it, we found it in uh, Alexander Pope's essay on criticism as well, where Pope says that uh, uh, criticizing a work of art, a work of literature, it's like uh, looking at a dome uh, the rhyme is a dome in Rome, and uh, uh, he says that basically when we look at a dome, we should appreciate all its beauty rather than just uh, focusing on its uh, decontextualized uh, details. And according to Johnson and many neoclassical critics, uh, this is the same for Shakespeare and for any other uh, work of literature. 
Of course, uh, uh, Johnson's uh, uh, preface is not uh, as clear cut in its approach to Shakespeare and all the other fields. It has, all, it has often been uh, referred to as outdated, uh, since he adopts, uh, seemingly adopts this sort of neoclassical approach to Shakespeare at a time when this was not the most fashionable uh, way to uh, approach his works. And we can see this tension uh, between uh, the sort of outdated neoclassical approach and the new way of looking at Shakespeare, for example, in the idiosyncrasies of his approach to Shakespeare's morality. Uh, Johnson's, uh, Johnson famously, st famously states that uh, Shakespeare sacrifices virtue to convenience, and is so much more careful to please than to instruct that he seems to write without any moral purpose. At the same time, he also admits that uh, the representation of nature fills the place of Shakespeare with practical axioms and domestic wisdom. It may be said of Shakespeare that from his works may be collected a system of civil and economical prudence. So which one is it? Is it Shakespeare moral or is it immoral? According, according to me, I, I think at least that uh, to me here, uh, Johnson is displaying this sort of tension, as I said, between two critical modes. On the one hand, from a neoclassical perspective, Shakespeare does not comp comply with the principle of poetic justice. His, uh, the good characters don't always try at the end, and the uh, bad characters don't, don't always die, and actually there are no good and bad characters. Uh, at the same time, Johnson admits uh, that uh, the passages of Shakespeare's words are imbued with a sort of wisdom that, however, does not, uh, uh, does not, um, is not part of a coherent system of morality, just uh, scattered passages of particular uh, significance and morality. So uh, throughout the, uh, the 18th century, uh, another neoclassical uh, precept that is adopted to Shakespeare is the beauties and faults approach. And even within uh, this approach uh, to Shakespeare, we can see a shift from a more generic uh, interest in his work as a whole and uh, uh, an interest in his passages. So uh, beauty and false criticism is the idea that when we judge an, uh, an author, we should uh, highlight his good parts and his bad parts. And it has been applied to Shakespeare since the earliest uh, English criticism. So Thomas Reimer, but also uh, Dryden and, and Dennis. So for example, Dennis states that Shakespeare is good at representing nature, but one of his faults is that he does lack uh, classical erudition. Uh, when uh, the first editions are published, we can see how this beauty and faults approach to criticism is applied at the textual, in the textual aspect. So there is already um, identification of uh, his best passages. And we can see here an example from Rose edition, uh, which delegates uh, this task uh, in the index. And you can see here in the part I have highlighted, it's uh, the quarter between, for example, um, Brutus and Cassius. Uh, Rowe uh, highlights in the index that it is, this is one of the Shakespeare's beauties, one of Shakespeare's most beautiful passages. But in order to read it, the reader is redirected to the original play. And you can see here, uh, volume six, uh, page uh, 212. And the same uh, is true for Pope, uh, who does not interrupt the flow of the play. He just uh, famously uses this sort of sign. So here is an asterisk that uh, marks the same passage as a beauty of Shakespeare. Uh, another uh, element uh, of uh, criticism that uh, influences the, the practice of reading Shakespeare passages is uh, pseudo Longinus treatise on the sublime, which was famously rediscovered during the Renaissance and which arrived in England uh, through uh, Nicola Boileau um, translation and, what, and was later uh, translated multiple times in English as well. Basically, uh, Longinus. Uh, replaced the traditional idea or the classical idea of literary beauty as a sort of balance, uh, instead with the idea that uh, uh, work of literature has its highs and its lows, uh, which by itself uh, um, displayed the interest in these highs, in these uh, adelaide passages of beauties. And at the same time, it erases uh, the faults because uh, it states that uh, any work of art, uh, ooh, uh, you can see here in, in the quotation, uh, it is next, next to impossible that he who writes in a middling low way should commit many faults. For as he runs no hazards, no hazards and never attempts to rise, he still continues safe, and that he to wear upon his guard. But the sublime itself, and by its own natural force, is lubricous and full of danger. So if you write in a beautiful way, then you are bound to make mistakes. 
And since the very first English uh, translations of uh, Longinus, uh, this treatise has been applied to Shakespeare. So um, Leonard Wenstead and also William Smith uh, appended their, their own observations on the uh, treatise to their translations, and they, they, all, uh, they all quote Shakespeare and apply this uh, principle to Shakespeare. So all these uh, sort of subterranean uh, critical approaches emerge uh, I think at least in one of the most famous anthologies of the time, which is William Dodd's The Beauties of Shakespeare. Perhaps you may have heard of him. He, his name was actually Dr. Reverend William Dodd. And he was uh, uh, he was a socialite. He was called the Macaroni Parson. Uh, he was uh, this sort of uh, Reverend Alamod, uh, who, who really who had this approach, which uh, I call uh, sort of populism, um, populistic uh, uh, editorial approach to Shakespeare, or uh, here I think I called it anti-intellectual uh, intellectualism. He presents itself, uh, himself as an alternative to establish the forms of uh, edi uh, editorship, but he also follows the same footsteps that uh, he's criticizing. So for example, uh, in the in the preface to his anthology, here he is uh, saying that he really despises the editors of Shakespeare because they just spend all the time uh, uh, quarreling with each other in the preface. And a couple of pages earlier, he himself uh, is, uh, we can see he do the same things and uh, um, complaining about Sir Thomas Hammer, uh, that he proceeds in the most unjustifiable method, or Mr. Warburton preferred his own criticism to his other words. And we can find this sort of hypocrisy uh, in many aspects uh, of his work. Uh, for example, in the preface, it also states that he will avoid using any uh, Greek or Latin or even English works that are not uh, easily understandable by the public. And then he goes on to do exactly that. <laughs> We can see here uh, in this uh, anthologization of uh, measure for measure, where the word heaven has this very lengthy, uh, unnecessary um, footnote where, where he quotes uh, authors in Italian and, and in Latin, and sometimes even without any translation. So in, in some way, while rejecting the modes of traditional editorship of Shakespeare, William Dodd is also positioning himself as an editor of Shakespeare and as his anthology as a sort of abridged edition of Shakespeare's works. And we can see this in his practices of an anthologization as well. So for example, he, uh, I argue that he does encourage his readers to read the anthology sequentially. So uh, here is an example for Harry, from Harry the Fifth when um, uh, one title is Description of Victory by the French and it's followed by another title which is just by the English. So it creates this sort of Zygma-like uh, syntactical structure that makes the two passages dependent from one another. We see it is in his titles as well. Uh, so he, 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 doesn't, he does not employ a lot of commonplace titles. Uh, and his, his titles are not like, like, for example, anger, but they do cite the name of the characters. So Macbeth Stamper, uh, Lady Macbeth uh, on, the new, on the news of Duncan's approach. So he collocates uh, the passages within the fable. And, uh, and also it does preserve a narrative, we can see this as, as well in the index. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the focus is not on the emotion, on the commonplace uh, universalizing feeling, but on the character. So for example, under the letter H, uh, the reader can uh, follow Hamlet's character arc uh, throughout the play. Uh, um, uh, the edition of Dodd's Beauties uh, that really had success was, was however, uh, not the one that was uh, edited by him. So from the 18th century, there are three editions, but uh, Dodd becomes very popular after his bizarre death. And you can ask me more about it later if you want to know about it. But he dies in a very public way that draws interest upon him. And the editors basically exploit this but at the same time, they do recognize that these footnotes are unnecessary. <laughs> this work as an editor is very tedious. So in 1818, there is a, they, they released a reduced, an abridged edition of uh, his uh, own abridged edition of Shakespeare, where they remove basically all of his unnecessary paradoxes. And you can see the differences here. So this is a dot edition of um, of the beauties, and uh, this is uh, uh, his, um, the, the soliloquy of Hamlet, the to be or not to be soliloquy. So this is uh, Dodd's edition. So this is the first page. All, all those are full notes. 
it looks like an Italian version of the Divine Comedy. So one, then two, then three, then four. All this in the 1818 edition becomes just this, which is much more reasonable and which is reprinted more than 30 times uh, just uh, throughout the 19th century. A lot of readers, including Goethe, read Shakespeare for the first time uh, by, by uh, yeah, the means of those. So, uh, yeah, um, these, uh, all of these editions speak uh, to the readers, uh, employs a reader um, response approach, uh, which uh, is uh, inspired by Longinus, as Dodd uh, himself uh, um, states. Basically, uh, he, he argues that uh, um, there is, he displaces the authority of this objective critic that decides which are the duties and which are the faults of Shakespeare by stating that anybody can decide with which characters they can relate best. So the old, the grave, and the severe will disapprove perhaps the most soft, uh, trifling love tales, while the young people may like those parts and uh, dislike other parts of Shakespeare. Uh, all this uh, is uh, from, a, from a sort of aesthetic point of view. It's also translated to the morality of Shakespeare. So I mentioned earlier how a neoclassical criticism looked at Shakespeare's uh, plays through the lenses of uh, um, decorum and uh, um, poetic justice, so this sort of fable-based approach. And then these shifts, I identify uh, the shift uh, um, in Elizabeth Montague's An essay in the writings and genius of Shakespeare, when basically she says that the Shakespeare impact uh, is emotional and it's based on the, the impression that uh, his readers and spectators have uh, of his distinct uh, passages. But also, uh, again, uh, his, Shakespeare's passages are not considered in isolation from his fable, but the impact is made within uh, the reader's mind between the passage and the overall fable, over, the overall play. And uh, Montague um, explains this uh, uh, visually. Uh, this is uh, an extract from her essay, and you can see uh, uh, that the first two lines uh, are the aphoristic truth, which is exerted, separated from the entire passage. So basically, she replicates the mental um, process that uh, happens within the reader's mind. Uh, we see the aphoristic truth and we recognize it, but also always within uh, a bigger passage. And this method is employed by Elizabeth Griffith in the variety of Shakespeare's drama Illustrated, her own anthology, which uh, she explicitly states is inspired by Montague's essay. This is just um, an, a, an example from uh, her own anthology. We can see here that uh, um, instead of uh, um, doing what Montague did and just um, quoting the passage before, she uh, puts it in italics at the end, you can see, and also explains the moral relevance relevance of each passage um, uh, before uh, quoting it as well. And uh, so to conclude, we can see that uh, uh, actually in the critic as well, um, like the Dodd uh, does not employ a commonplace method of uh, anthologizing Shakespeare, and she explains that she does that, this on purpose uh, because uh, mm, she thinks that uh, although Shakespeare's fable is not moral, it does serve a moral purpose insofar as it aids the utile dulci, uh, the entertainment part of the learning process. And she also does anchor the morality of Shakespeare in the fable by stating that Shakespeare actually abides by another unity, not the Aristotelian unit, but another one, the unity of character. She thinks that Shakespeare's character, uh, characters are coherent within uh, the, the play, and as such, the reader can decide, like Dodd state, um, stated, uh, on which character, to which character they relate the most. So every age, every sex, every character, every station, every, every social class is represented in Shakespeare, and every reader can find the, the passages to which they relate the most, and they can learn their morality the most. And just to conclude, I do argue that the, there is a, a sort of aphorismization, a, a sort of journey towards the aphorism in the 18th century. And we can see it in the uh, later collections, the collections published later in the century, like The Beauties of Shakespeare, not by Dodd, by, by, but by another publish, who, publisher who did choose the same title as Dodd, I think, uh, to confuse the readers. <laughs> And, uh, and for example, aphorisms from Shakespeare, you can see some excerpts here. They, they are, they're just adopt a uh, commonplace structure and they do decontextualize these works. And also um, the editor uh, of aphorisms from Shakespeare does admit that they had 
eliminated some words that uh, refer to the circumstantiation, to the fable, to the narrative, because they, we don't need them. <laughs> So uh, to conclude, uh, I think that uh, uh, by the end of the century, uh, the architecture of Shakespeare's plays has really changed from Johnson's preface. And I think that the actual building that represents Shakespeare the most is not uh, Johnson, it's, it's not the brick uh, that is separated from the house, but is another metaphor, which was used by used Theobald before Johnson. But Theobald uh, was uh, indeed a uh, big foreshadow many things with, with this edition. So, um, according to this metaphor, uh, Shakespeare is like a sort of house with many, many rooms, that, and you can take it at once. He says that uh, Shakespeare, just Shakespeare's plays are like like so many gaudy apartments pouring at once upon the eye, diffuse and throw themselves out to the mind. The prospect is too wide to come within the compass of a single view. So they must be separated. And uh, uh, this separation entails that every part is for different readers. So some parts are often finished up to hit the taste of the connoisseur, other more negligently put together to strike the fancy of a common and a learned beholder. Thank you. Thank you, Bert. Thank you very much, um, especially for the architectural meta <laughs> that stimulating to Shakespeare in the 18th century. Um, I will uh, give the speech to uh, Adelaide. She's hearing us. So Adelaide Pagano is uh, currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University uh, Federico II of uh, Naples. Um, her research interests, as I will know, are concentrating upon Shakespeare recension in the European space in the 18th century between Italy, France, and England. Uh, I had the pleasure to supervise with my colleague uh, Vincenzo De Santis, a uh, PhD on uh, Martin Sherlock, the fragments of Shakespeare. And this is the argument she will explain to us with a special uh, subject today of the beauté intraduisible, the details intraduisible de Shakespeare, the fragment of Martin Schell. And the talk will be in French, I think. 